So I'm not really a podcaster and this isn't going to be very polished. I usually confine myself to live calls um, for self-directed education facilitation and everything else I usually do written. Um, but on this occasion, I really need to talk um, because I think if I write, it's going to get complicated. And although we've had quite a bit of discussion on this topic um, in some of the facilitation training groups, I think it's important in the season that's usually associated with goodwill and peace <laughs> to offer a bit of publicly available commentary on this article. So, yeah, as you would already know, um, discussing um, Daniel Greenberg's recently shared um, article, Let's Be Clear, Sudbury Valley School and Unschooling Have Nothing in Common. Um, it was written a couple of years ago, but um, it's had much wider distribution just recently, and um, it's stirring up a lot of discussion and controversy and some very strong feelings, which all has value. But I really wanted to just add a bit of context um, to, yeah, um, help look at at um, at what we really need to focus on, perhaps. Um, to my mind, Danny's shining a nice big light on something that a lot of us otherwise wouldn't notice. But it's a very strong light and a bit of a glare for some of us, and we want to look away. It's certainly waking us up. And this is an awesome opportunity for us to all notice that we don't know what we don't know and start exploring together. And that's really the aim of, of this contribution that I'm making now, um, is rather than letting this be divisive, um, let's use it to stimulate um, growth and learning together as we can discuss and explore. Um, this um, input is obviously my own perception. Um, I'm one person. Um, and I don't intend this to replace discussion in the community, but rather to make a contribution to that discussion. Obviously, Sudbury and unschooling both fall under the umbrella of self-directed education. And from that perspective, factually, they do have a lot in common. But they are very different iterations of self-directed education. And I think it's really worth having a closer look at this. Um, and it's also worth uh, looking, I think, at what... Um, Danny is saying in terms of where we get confused uh, about what self-directed education really is and is not. So to really um, say what I need to say about this topic, I'm going to need to lay some foundations first. So bear with me. And if this is already familiar to you, you can just skip it. But I think it's useful to get some context to bear in mind. So I first want to talk briefly about the concept of the four levels of competence. So the four levels of competence idea of, of mastering anything is that we all start from a place of not knowing that we don't know. So unconscious incompetence. Um, we've all seen this. We've all been there. For example, we pick up a guitar and we learn how to play one chord <laughs> and <laughs> we think we're now the next Jimi Hendrix because we know one chord because we simply don't realize how much more there is to know and how little we actually do know. Um, the next stage is to move into conscious incompetence of going, whoa, okay, I now am moving to the next stage where I realize how much more there is to know. And although I now feel less competent, um, I actually know a lot more than I used to know. And working through that we get to the place where we can actually achieve conscious competence, where we now do know quite a lot and we know that we know it. Um, we, we actually are becoming masterful. But to really get to the next um, level of, of final mastery, we need to get to the point where we've integrated everything to the point that we don't even realize how much we know now. And from that perspective, it can be quite difficult sometimes to speak to the beginner who's still in, in stage one, because at stage four, um, we're not all that conscious of what it is that we know and that that we've integrated. So often people who are very masterful will not realize that other people don't know the same things or haven't got the same foundations as they do because it's become so much a part of themselves. They're not aware of it. And of course, it's not just one, two, three, four, and then you're done. Anything and everything is always a, an ascending spiral of learning, 
we revisit those stages at higher levels again and again and again as we grow and go around and around. So my point is that I think that we as a collective, the self-directed education community, um, also travel through these stages. It's not just an individual thing. So at the beginning, as a community, we don't know what we don't know. Um, it's only very recently that we've even had the language to describe what's going on in self-directed education or even the label, the phrase itself, to label self-directed education. And we are busy grappling with what we don't know that we don't know in order to become more aware of where the gaps in our knowledge and competence are so that we can move towards more conscious mastery. And I think that a, an opportunity like this is really great um, for tackling all of that consciously and overtly and, and really making some shifts there on those levels. So next I'd like to take a quick look at a diagram that I've been working on. Um, most of the uh, literature around self-directed education is anecdotal and much of the learning is experiential and that's great uh, but it does lead to some fuzziness and um, confusion. So I've really been trying to work on defining things, diagramming them, distilling them, just so that we can get some clarity. And I think in the context of this article, it's important to do that. So this is a diagram that looks at the differences between different approaches to education. So in the center, we've got their goals, values, worldview, content, methods, timing. All of those things, when they are... Um, determined by somebody else in the mainstream, um, for example, by a school principal or a government um, or a particular pedagogical approach, that that is what you get um, in mainstream school. So if you want to see a child educated according to mainstream goals, according to um, standard accepted timing, using um, mainstream methods, following a predetermined curriculum. School is what you want. School is what will give you that. If you want um, to see a child educated according to the parents' goals, the parents' values, the parents' worldview, with the parents in charge of the contents, the methods and the timing, you want home education. If you want a child educated according to alternative goals, values, worldviews, etc., you want whatever that alternative is. Now many of these things are often considered part-time or supplementary such as um, Sunday school, madrasa, Hebrew school, um, cultural schools for, for different uh, indigenous traditions um, or some things that are becoming popular now like activist school. Um, so then that's really where you want to go. Um, would be those alternative education institutions, be they full-time or part-time. When we talk about self-directed education, we're talking about the individual's own goals, values, worldview, content, methods, and timing. And this is a useful diagram for me because it really makes this clear. At first, because most of us grew up with school and school surrounds us and school is the norm, when we leave school and we step into the alternative, it can feel like everything else is in the same block. It's school and not school or, you know, school and unschooling. And then I, I've noticed that there's often a lot of confusion, especially with people who are newly stepping out of school, that they kind of lump all three different alternatives there into the same boat and they can't really see the distinctions between them. So you'll get parents who've taken their child out of school and they now feel that self-directed education is what they want to do, but their understanding of that is that the child is now going to be pursuing the parents' goals, usually which have some sort of alternative value to them. So for example, my child's no longer in a mainstream school, they're now going to grow organic vegetables and do yoga. Or my child's no longer in a mainstream school, they're now going to learn about my family's heritage and our uh, religion or they're going to uh, learn how to just weave cloth and uh, whatever it is. The point is that there, there can be confusion around 
um, what self-directed ed education is and isn't. And that's why I want to use this diagram to make really clear. And I think this is part of what Daniel Greenberg is saying in this article. I think he's expressing, among other things, his frustration um, at seeing self-directed education defined as something that the parents still um, want to control according to their own alternative value set. Um, for example, offering certain enriching activities according to the parents' concept of what is enriching. Um, whereas he's really underlining the fact that self-directed education is about um, giving the child the freedom to be um, what they are and pursue their own goals according to their own values, to build their own worldview using the content of their own choice, the methods of their own choice, and the timing that, that, that fits their being. And that's an important distinction to draw and something to get clear. And it's fine if we start out not knowing that we don't know this. That is just a first stage. And I think that's where some people are feeling hurt and offended is if you're in the early stages and you haven't really got these distinctions clear yet because you've just left school um, and you haven't done that much reading up and thinking about this, it can feel really harsh when he says, you know, um, if you're offering these activities to the child, that's not self-directed education. That's not what we do here. Um, and it's a, it's a stage that we all go through to really sort of come to understand where the boundaries are and what the differences are. So I'd like to move on now to a, another related diagram. So this diagram helps us have a bit of a think about um, how different forms of education overlap. It would need three dimensions in order to take into account the alternative um, education, which also isn't all that relevant to this topic. So things like Waldorf schools, TM schools, um, we could deal with separat separately, but I don't think they're that pertinent today. So let's just have a look here. There's a lot of um, overlap and, and shades in between each thing. So if you look at the overlap between school and home education, that's where you would get what's classically called homeschooling or school at home. So the parents are still taking that curriculum, they're still taking those values, they're still taking that worldview, but they're trying to achieve it on the home front instead of in a school institution. So, for example, a lot of um, people take that as a first step when they take their child out of school. They at first think that it's just a matter of class sizes and bullies and strict teachers um, rather than really looking at the content or the approach or the nature of the education that's going on. And they try to become kinder teachers doing it in a nicer way at home. Then when that starts to overlap with self-directed education on the school front, um, you, you look at school going into um, this sort of a slight nod towards self-direction. That's where you get things like progressive schools that try to make it more fun. Um, whereas, you know, as Daniel Greenberg elsewhere points out, this is a very dangerous thing because it can... Um, make children feel as if they have a little more freedom than they do, which is kind of getting them used to being suckers. Um, you get things like Montessori, where you can choose your timing, um, but not your content or your method. You get um, democratic schools, and there's a lot of confusion here because democratic schools in some places mean self-directed, and in other places merely mean that the students can vote, for example, um, voting for the projects or the topic that's to be studied. Um, and quite close down to self-directed education, you get things like Reggio Emilia, where there actually is some self-direction going on, um, but it's still within that value system of the school, that concept of the adult being the one who knows what needs to be done and should guide it, rather than trusting the individual to actually unfold according to their own being. Um, which is when we get right down into that true blue self-directed education. Um, then let's look at within self-directed education, you get different iterations, many, many different ways to practice it. I mean, just listing a few here, Agile would be one, um, Sudbury's and Circle Schools, STE co-ops, 
and unschooling according to a certain definition of unschooling. And this is where, again, I repeat that I'm not a polished podcaster, and that was my phone, which is what I'm recording on. Um, so I'm going to leave that in, because I've also learned that if I take the time to try to make things technically perfect, I often don't get things done. Um, so I'm going to stay realistic, leave that glitch in, and carry on. So we're having a look at this diagram here, um, and this is, I think, where we get to um, all of the controversy in this article. Because what I've done in this diagram is I've listed unschooling three times. So there's the unschooling that's down in the self-directed education center in the blue, which would be where, just returning to the previous diagram, when the parents' own values coincide with self-directed education values, you get unschooling that is truly self-directed education. So this means that those parents are truly respecting their child's own um, values, goals, um, ability to develop their own worldview for themselves, um, giving them space to pursue their own chosen content according to their own methods and their own timing. And I think that some of these unschoolers are maybe feeling pretty sore <laughs> at um, this article because they're going, hey, you know, it's uh, we, we're not um, presenting our children with an array of parentally approved activities and we're actually um, really taking quite a bit of strain and working really hard to try and offer our child a truly self-directed education um, within a family or world schooling setting. Then I think the, the confusion comes sort of as we move back up towards home education because in that overlap between home education and self-directed education. Again, there's many degrees of practice. Uh, sometimes just because people are still busy in their own de-schooling process, they've come out of school, they don't realize how far there is to go, they don't know how much there is that they don't know that they don't know. And, you know, any step further away from school feels amazing and feels like a huge amount of freedom. So at the first level, you would get simply relaxed homeschooling. So we're still doing the curriculum, um, but, you know, our kids are sort of getting so much choice about how to do it, um, which really is progressive education at home. Um, and there's a great article by Peter Gray on the difference between progressive education and self-directed education that I highly recommend. Um, let's put a link for it over here. And um, then on the other hand, maybe what's also very common is, OK, we'll just do the English and the maths because those are sort of the core subjects according to that whole schooled value system and um, understanding and worldview, but the kids other than that will um, get to choose what else they want to do. But then very often at that stage, you've also got parents who feel very strongly that they still want it to be recognizable and justifiable. So they're very comfortable with a child taking cookery classes or um, s sort of really working hard on their skateboarding or whatever it is, <clears throat> but they don't really support things that look like just socializing or goofing off. So there you've got all these different degrees, partly sometimes because people are de-schooling and partly sometimes because um, a family actually isn't that comfortable with pure, true, self-directed education. They're actually more comfortable with some other form of sort of progressive or semi-self-directed education. So that's why I've written unschooling three times there because in different colors, because I, I really think it's a very big community and it's quite nebulous and people are falling into different forms of practice that, that make sense to them. And I think this is also um, where Daniel Greenberg experiences a problem uh, with some of those families who are in the purple rather than the blue coming to Sudbury Valley or arguing with Sudbury Valley. And this isn't typical, I mean, this isn't um, exclusive to Sudbury Valley School. I think um, quite a few of us who are running facilities experience this, that we will have um, people who say they are unschooling, but they don't want their child to have certain experiences in our facility. They still want to be able to have some parental control over those goals, values, worldviews, methods. Um, 
they, so they, some of them want particular outcomes or some of them want to just make sure that their child isn't exposed to certain opportunities like, wow, they definitely can't come here and play Minecraft. Um, or they also want to access the facility as if it was a co-op um, for families rather than a Sudbury. So they're not really comfortable with their child coming out of from underneath the parent's wing. And of course, there's also the unschoolers who are unschooling um, precisely because they feel that the parent-child relationship, the family relationship, is really the primary place for learning to happen. And they actively value that um, opportunity to really be together as a family, to have prolonged um, parent-child interaction, and for education to be grounded in that. Um, so... Obviously, if you're in that space, then something like a Sudbury isn't going to look like a value add. Um, so, you know, th there's there's a whole array, basically, is what I'm saying. And this is maybe where, um, you know, Daniel Greenberg maybe also doesn't know what he doesn't know. Uh, there's no reason why he should be an expert on unschooling. It's not his iteration. Jimi Hendrix, as far as I know, didn't play the... Um, uh, bassoon <laughs> you know um, and he's encountering the people that he's encountering and the frustrations that he's um, experiencing and let me just also make it really clear I'm not speaking for <laughs> Daniel Green but I would not presume that um, you know uh, this is my my kind of um, perception and maybe projection uh, and I'd be very interested to to hear what his response is if he ever chooses to engage with this uh, little lecture that I'm giving right now. But I can also really feel the pain, you know, for somebody who's been working on something for 50 years and created something really unique with a lot of um, really powerful characteristics um, that enable educational experiences that I don't think you can really get any other way anywhere else um, on the one hand it's like unschoolers we don't really want somebody who's not an unschooler saying what unschooling is in just the same way I think there's pain from having um, people say what Sudbury is from a perspective of not knowing that they don't know um, and I think that that's where a lot of the frustration and the pain in this article comes from. Um, when this really complex, uh, beautifully designed um, organism that is Sudbury Valley School is kind of reduced to just uh, just an unschooling facility um, where there's babysitting. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think we've got two sides being triggered by each other here. And that's really what I want to harness and, and maybe move beyond. Um, I'm intrigued by the statements about um, John Holt and John Holt's perspective. Um, and this is where I'm very, very aware that I don't know. So yeah, I know that I don't know. I, I cannot claim to know a lot about um, John Holt's perspective. Um, and exactly what he intended when he um, became the founder, if you like, of the whole unschooling movement. What I what does um, seem interesting to me is that in the article here where um, Greenberg says that Holt says that Sudbury Valley is not unschooling, is that this interaction to me seems to have happened quite early on for both of them. Um, right near the beginnings of, of both of their journeys and I don't know how much uh, each of them knew that they knew or didn't know um, I don't think progressive education had been that clearly defined self-directed education certainly hadn't been that clearly defined and I do wonder how much um, Holt would differentiate those now and to what extent he would recognize a an aspect of progressive education in his um suggestions of how unschooling happen um, or whether he would revise his suggestions in the light of today's clearer distinctions and research and definitions it's it's really hard to say so 
So I think it's important to recognize that self-directed education is an umbrella and that under that umbrella uh, the child is recognized as a full human being with the same rights as adults and there's a recognition that nobody truly can or should direct or evaluate anybody else's education as well as a recognition that education is holistic and not divided into artificial subjects it's grounded in life experience not something you do in some spaces and not in others there are these these common threads that get expressed in many different um, iterations types of facilities um, different forms of unschooling and yeah I mean I'd be quite interested to to see the unschooling community um, creates a, a bit more of an idea of, of different taxonomies within the unschooling community again if it can be done in a way that is an articulation and an aha and a useful help to find your tribe thing rather than um, being judgmental or divisive so after all that rambling to clarify my own point of view I do not agree with the statement that it is always best for those involved in the admissions process of my own facility to do their best to discourage unschoolers from enrolling. Um, that may or may not be true for SVS, depending on what kind of unschoolers they encounter. Um, I do agree that it is really important to warn them of the possible pitfalls of such a move. I find that many families, both unschoolers and people who've come straight out of school, don't really understand what a Sudbury offers and it's important for them to know what they're signing up for. Um, it is um, very unique and um, from my perspective there are many families in our vicinity who would call themselves unschoolers who have actually found a very good fit um, with a Sudbury type um, facility and we anticipate that that will continue. There are also many unschooling families who are very, very clear that <laughs> we're completely irrelevant to them, and that's also fine, and I do believe that we can live alongside each other in harmony. Yeah. I want to touch on the issue of socialization because I think that's also something that's um, quite a hot topic coming out of this article. Um, yeah, there's definitely no comparison between play dates that happen once or twice a week or meeting other kids at karate class versus the kind of immersed, ongoing, cumulative relationships that you can develop in an ongoing community that meets every day. And at the same time, I do think that there's maybe some confusion around... Um, the sources of some of the experiences that we have at facilities with um, kids who come in with very little social skill. I think it's really important to also recognize that um, there are a lot of different factors. <laughs> you know, it's like um, like the, they always say, it's like if you're homeschooling, then the world says that everything is because you're homeschooling. Um, but there's a lot of different factors at play. Some families have cultures that are very, very permissive, um, where the children do have license rather than freedom balanced with responsibility, where instead of a partnership, an egalitarian partnership, um, there's actually a reversal of power roles in that the parents are being martyrs and the kids are ruling the roost. And uh, yeah, that is going to lead to a kind of a different level of social skill, but that can happen um, in any kind of educational background, not only unschooling. Um, and obviously unschooling is not necessarily going to engender that kind of relationship. Um, yeah, ask Akila Richards <laughs> if you think I'm wrong. Um, yeah, uh, so the, the other thing is that a lot of people who withdraw from school withdraw from school environments because it doesn't work for, for them in many ways, including neurodiversity. And I'm talking neurodiversity in the broad sense of the word rather than just a kind of a euphemism specifically for autism. But 
you know, a lot of us have different ways of thinking and being um, and, and kind of neurological patterning. And, and a lot of that also has impact on our social abilities and um, our forms and styles of social interaction. So the fact that we then also choose unschooling or Sudbury isn't necessarily then the cause of our ability to socialize in certain ways or not socialize in certain ways. Um, there's, there's a lot going on there. So, yeah. Um, essentially, I think there's something that's really important to realize in that we're not living in the hunter-gatherer culture that um, Peter Gray describes when he, he looks at sort of the origins of self-directed education. We are not living, most of us, in a reality where our children can walk out of the door. I mean, even there's a door to walk through, you know. They're not sitting around a campfire with a selection of other children and adults 24-7. Um, they're not free to ramble and roam safely out of their parents' view and, and develop a, a variety of relationships with with different people. So we are not living in that reality. And I think both unschooling and um, self-directed education facilities are, they're both an, uh, kind of a, a response to an artificial situation that we're living in, trying to do the best that we can. Um, on the one hand, um, an unschooling family trying to make as many experiences uh, available as possible in spite of being in a modern nuclear setup where maybe you do have to make an extra effort to um, make certain people and experiences available to your child simply because they cannot free range to find them um, and that that's not necessarily an interference with the child's self-direction it depends on how it's done and on the other hand having a facility that children get dropped off at and they go there every day Yes, that is an artificial construct, but it allows for the development of a kind of a continuity of community um, that's really quite unique in our space and time and an exercise of, of um, learning um, self-empowerment for children that's really quite unique in our space and time that couldn't really be achieved any other way. So everybody is trying to do the best they can with what they've got and where they are. And I think that that's, for me, the really critical thing for us to recognize. Yeah, sure, we can all learn, we can all grow. None of us is perfect. Um, perfect isn't human. Um, and again, this isn't about the schoolish values of um, trying to play who's right and be competitive and who's doing it the best way. Uh, we're, we're actually kind of aspiring to maybe leave that behind and... Um, go for um, more of an adventure, more of an open-ended approach where we can look at how do we support each other, how do we learn in our own ways and, and yet together in a way that, that takes us collectively forward rather than just individually forward. So yeah, here we are, we are in this context and um, my wish for us for this year ahead is that individually we can realize more of what we don't know that we don't know, move more into knowing that we don't know and developing our competence to know that we know and collectively as well. We're busy defining this thing and it's so exciting. And yeah, let's not let divisions bust us apart just at the point where we are starting to articulate what we are coming to know. Um, because it's actually really exciting to uh, map out this territory and look at where the distinctions and the subtleties are, as well as the commonalities. And let's keep working together. And I really look forward to hearing um, this discussion continue and different people's views on it and different responses to what I have said today. Uh, please point out what I don't know what I don't know, because you know what? Uh, that's how I grow. So, peace, and let's look forward to an awesome 2019.